if you could just give me your attention onto the screen for a minute and a half. Thank you. Uganda is joining the oil producing nations of the world. Following the FID, the oil and gas sector in Uganda is set to grow and so are the exposures. With foreign investments of over $10 billion in equipment, operators, drillers, service contractors and manufacturers of related parts and products, there are unique risks at every stage of the oil and gas production process. We are the Insurance Consortium for Oil and Gas Uganda. With over 18 members, this consolidation defines capacity and commitment to cover all the high-risk projects now underway in the oil and gas sectors. With our expertise, we are able to offer comprehensive insurance solutions for upstream and land-based oil and gas operators, non-operators and service contractors in Uganda. Our panel of A-rated reinsurers covers all risks using international standards based on international market terms and conditions that are reviewed and regulated by the Insurance Regulatory Authority of Uganda. As we move toward a brighter future, insurance will play a critical role in supporting environmental, social and governance efforts promoting the effectiveness of the oil and gas sector. We are here to make this a reality. It is about Uganda, and managing the risks in this venture will be of benefit to us all. Thank you very much. This session will be moderated by partly my co-MC, the Steinbeck Business Incubator CEO, Mr. Tony Otoa and also the Head of Business Development East Africa at Standard Bank Group, Mr. Michael Mahanji, and they'll be up here in a moment. But before they do, I'd like to invite somebody who has a small presentation, and she goes by the name of Miss Betty Namubiru. She's the National Content Manager at the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. She's a local content expert in this sector. She holds a master's degree in economic planning and an Honours Bachelor of Science degree in Economics and Statistics, all from Makerere University. She has worked with the Belgian Development Agency as a National Technical Advisor for the support of Skilling Uganda Project. She is also a member of the sector's Skills Council and is currently working as, like I said, the National Content Manager with PAU. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Ms. Betty Namuiru for her presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. All protocol observed. As I've been introduced, I'm working with the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. I know you've heard a lot about the work we do in terms of uh, uh, promoting value retention in the country and in other aspects. But this presentation is just only going to give you uh, a case of a project that we are implementing and is being funded by the African Development Bank. Um, well, uh, like I said, today we are discussing SME-related aspects. How can we get the private sector involved in the oil and gas sector? but also how much value can we retain from the investments that are coming. We have known that we have 20 billion US dollars, but specifically talking about the eco project between 3.5 and 4 billion is going to be invested in the country. So this project comes in to support the competitiveness of the companies that are in the 10 districts of the eco to see how best can we support them. These districts are rural in nature. Probably the biggest part of the services that they do are more into agriculture and agribusiness. So this project is coming in to see 
not only the, the pipeline going through, but uh, providing a mechanism that can support the participation of the people in these, in these 10 districts. So like I said, it's an African Development Bank funded project uh, crossing the 10 districts. It has a number of components that we'll be looking at, but very specifically for me to mention is that uh, upon conclusion of the intergovernment uh, agreement discussions with the government of Tanzania, it was agreed that we need to promote cooperation between the two countries, but also to support uh, local content development in the new countries. So this project is mainly uh, going to be implemented in Uganda, but also uh, in Tanzania. It's a half a million US dollar project that is going to be uh, looking at a number of objectives, as I will mention, but first and foremost, uh, to build capacity of at least 200 MSMEs, the micro, small, and medium enterprises along the 10 districts to see how best can we improve their skills. How can we get a small company uh, that is operating within these 10 ECOP districts to get them to a level that they can be able to supply the ECOP uh, project. Establish uh, a minimum of 50 business linkages between the micro enterprises and the SMEs, looking at how can we get, for example, a small logistics supplier company in Mwende and we link it to a national companies supplying at the national level so that they can be able to learn and uh, supply the oil and gas industry. But also establishment of a framework for sustainability. Like I said, this is an African Development Bank funded project looking at 200 SMEs to be implemented over a period of two years. So the question is, how can we ensure that this project continues beyond the life of the project? So this is uh, uh, the other component regarding sustainability. So under capacity building, uh, we'll be looking at identifying the small, medium, small and medium enterprises, micro, small and medium enterprises within the 10 districts. We identify a consultant to identify these companies clustered around different sectors to identify what is their potential. Which areas are they lacking in? Are they able to put up bid documents to respond to the calls for applications that come from these companies? We go ahead uh, through this component to conduct a needs assessment. The moment we identify the 200 firms that are going to be supported, we conduct a needs assessment to see what are the gaps. Having known their potential through that study, what gaps are available, and how can we come in? So based on the needs assessment, the, uh, the consultants will facilitate, will develop training programs that suit uh, the gaps that can be able to address the gaps. They develop training programs, then they facilitate the, the, the training. It also has a component of in-class training, but also mentoring. It's going to be a follow-up process, like I'll indicate in the next slide. So uh, there is going to be another opportunity of creation of business linkages, like I already said. How can we link these small f f uh, SMEs in these 10 districts to the nationwide you know, suppliers to make sure that they can understand the requirements of the industry, uh, what they, how they need to organize themselves and the specific services that they need to deliver. It also has a component that will look at youth and women how can we empower youth? How can we empower women to ensure that they can be able to participate in this project? Not only to see this four billion US dollar project passing, but being able to empower them to get the skills to, to work beyond uh, what they are, they are doing at the moment. The other second component is on monitoring and evaluation, of course, as you know, to track on reporting, we are talking about growth of uh, capacity and competitiveness of 200 SMEs, so the component is on monitoring and evaluation. We keep an eye to see these have been trained, clustered around this sector. How do we uh, uh, follow up to see that actually they are um, uh, actually participating in the oil and gas sector? So that is the project in summary. Uh, this slide is only giving us uh, quick progress on where we are. 
The project was uh, launched on the 29th of January, 2021. We have been able to launch uh, a tendering process. We have identified a consortium of firms that are going to support the business development component. And this is going to be spearheaded by Stanbic Bank Incubator. We all know their capacity when it comes to SME development. Uh, other components are ongoing, like the women and youth. We are in the process of evaluating who is going to support this training and the development and deliver of business linkages. We think this is a very important uh, discussion for us to bring to you today because you're the service providers that we'll need to work with as we speak about linkages. The logistics firms, the environment firms, the catering firms, you know, you'll need, we'll need to come up to you. We want to interest you in this project so that at a certain point you can come up to say, I did the mentoring of a certain company in Mubende or Rengo or any of the 10 districts. So this is very key and important for us to be able to, to look at. So in conclusion, the project presents opportunities for the local enterprises like I've indicated, but we have to avail ourselves. Uh, the, the contractors, the, the consultants have run calls for expression of interest. We expect you to express interest to support because at the end of the day, a successful implementation of this project is going to depend on your response. So we, der we therefore call upon the MSMEs to embrace the project and the opportunity to improve our competitiveness. Maybe lastly, as I discuss, we are also uh, looking at undertaking an update of the industry baseline survey. I know many of you have heard about this. It has helped the industry a lot in defining uh, what the needs are, where we stand as a country, which areas we need to develop, which JVs do we have to focus on. So that process is also ongoing and will come up to you to get this information, to know in the different sectors where do we stand. That study was done in 2013, but would like to have it upgraded. And I just wanted to again encourage you to provide as much information that can support the analysis to come up with a position of where the country stands in terms of capacity to support the oil and gas sector. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Betty. Betty is uh, still a panelist for the coming sessions, but she'll be seated over here. So during the conversation, if there's any question that you have for her regarding that project or anything else in the national content conversation at PAO, she's over here and will be part of the next conversation. I would now like to ask uh, the panelists I spoke about, the moderators, uh, Tony and Michael, to please come. For the rest of us, I really hope that you have been to the exhibitors. Uh, I see that uh, the rice and the potatoes and the chapati might take its toll with regards to keeping you awake. So this might be a small challenge, but luckily for you, I, I was visiting, I was up there in the morning, and I saw that there's a, an authentic Ugandan coffee business that is there. You should uh, go get a, a coffee to keep you awake. Oh, it's 100% it's Ugandan owned. I, I didn't know this. You should try. I think it's called Imara or something. Yeah, check it out. They're the only coffee place there up there. They're the only ones. Um, Tony, Michael, please. They will introduce their panel members and continue with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. A very good afternoon, everyone. I uh, would like to welcome you to this afternoon session. My colleague Tony and I have the pleasure this afternoon of moderating a panel of distinguished guests uh, who we'll introduce just now. Uh, the first guest uh, on the panel is Mr. Alex Mbonye, who is the local content manager at Kamod Beta. Alex, you're welcome. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Ronnie Musoke, who is a fund manager at ICOUG. Welcome, Ronnie. 
We also have with us Ms. Veronica Mawanda, who is the tax manager, oil and gas at PwC. I'll now ask uh, Tony to, to introduce the rest of the panelists. Okay, and on my side, um, I'll have Betty Namubiru come, come back. Oh, okay, so Betty Namubiru, it's okay, you can stay down there. I'll have uh, Mr. Agri Ashaba. Now, uh, Mr. Agri Ashaba is the general manager, GCC. He carries with him 19 years' experience in business development, setup, marketing and growth, ideas, and advisory. He's also led a number of setup and strategic engagements in education, transport, public sector, retail, and energy, and oil and gas. I agree, like I mentioned before, is the general manager of GCC Services, a leading camp management services provider in Africa and the Middle East. And I agree, is also the current general secretary of the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. With I agree, we shall also have Mr. Andrew Othieno. We were debating whether it's Othieno or Othieno. So I am glad to say it is Othieno. And Mr. Andrew Othieno is the manager standards department at uh, UNBS. He is also responsible for the design, development, implementation of programs for development and harmonization and publication of national standards. He has over 14 years experience in national and international regulatory verification, and he's done this for quite some time. And he'll be telling us about the ISO standard certifications and any of those certifications that we have thought or we have been thinking are elusive but very important for our businesses. And finally, on the panel, we'll have Mr. Robert Gensey. So Robert Gensey is a farmer. When we were debating and fighting over the presentations, he was saying, you know, farmers don't just do presentations. They have to show how things are done. Robert Gensey is currently um, the Global Agriculture Advisor for self Help Africa, supporting programs in Eritrea, Kenya, Ethiopia, Malawi, Uganda, and Zambia. He offers technical backstopping to country strategic in interventions, supporting efforts that build smallholder farming households into resilient households. He has experience as well in humanitarian assistance and also experience in value chain analysis monitoring and evaluation. Welcome. Thank you, Tony. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to encourage everyone, uh, as the panelists are speaking, please write down any questions that you might have. And at the end of the session, everyone will have an opportunity to ask the panelists uh, questions. So I think without any further delay, I think we can get right into uh, the panel discussion. And I'll start with Mr. Alex Mbonye the local content manager at Kamod Beta. Alex, uh, Kamod is one of the major local content providers currently working uh, in the oil and gas industry today, working in Tilenga. Uh, um, the title for this panel discussion is Experiences and Lessons So Far. So it would be helpful if you would just walk us through some of the experiences that you've had working in Tilenga maybe give us a little bit of uh, background about the scope of the work that you're doing, any challenges that you've faced, and proposals to overcome any challenges. Alex? Thank you, thank you, Michael. Uh, following the long-awaited FID and the Tilenga project kickoff, Kamod uh, Beta JV, which is a joint venture between Kamod uh, Fabrication Technologies Kenya and Beta uh, Projects Uganda uh, was one of the first uh, companies to be awarded a tier two a contract. Uh, this is, of course, through McDermott and to build the camp, a 3,910 man camp within 13 months. So this was a quite a, a, a momentous uh, occasion. We really had to step up and uh, we've, 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 we've had to mobilize our consortium members, suppliers, to align and deliver on this contract. And uh, so far, it's a steep learning curve, but we, uh, we believe we're on the right trajectory uh, with all the stakeholders involved, not only our client, but also our community, where we're working, 
we realize the responsibility in terms of uh, local content, uh, retaining the value. Uh, we have to actually uh, ensure that uh, as much as possible we have our local suppliers benefit as, as much as possible from this project. We have over 20 suppliers of various materials, services, and a uh, few months down the road, uh, we've been able to uh, actually increase our spend to several billion, and uh, they, they are working well with us. Uh, we have until the end of the year to make sure that uh, this project is delivered. And uh, I would say that uh, it's been a very interesting journey so far in such a short time to step up to the, 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 the quality required, the standard, deliver this project to uh, the oil and gas standard that is expected. And uh, we have matched basically uh, Ugandan talent, Ugandan uh, capital as well, with Turkish manufacturing technology and uh, in a real proper JV to deliver on this project. And uh, so far, we are doing quite well. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. I'm sure the audience will have several questions yeah. uh, regarding uh, what you've submitted, your experiences working in Telenga. Uh, moving on to Mr. Ronnie Musoke. Ronnie, we started by seeing a video from the UIA highlighting how insurance is a vital piece of the oil and gas industry going forward. Uh, large opportunities on the asset side, on the project side, on the people side with workmen. So talk us through some of the uh, opportunities that you see in the insurance space and maybe some challenges that you've faced so far and how you propose we could overcome any challenges. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, for the opportunity to be able to um, share some experiences with, um, uh, with the audience. But let me start by thanking the Uganda Chamber of Mines and Petroleum for yet again um, pulling off another conference um, under the circumstances. It has been very organized, and I think um, uh, we commend you for that. Uh, I would also like to thank the Petroleum Authority of Uganda for endorsing the Insurance Consortium for Oil and Gas. This I have to mention because this consortium was launched in uh, 2018 during a similar conference in uh, Munyonyo. So ever since then, uh, the discussion around uh, the level of preparedness was uh, to see uh, what kind of capacity we have in terms of financial and uh, human resource. But following the um, announcement of FID on uh, the 1st of February, we now moved from um, level of preparedness to now demonstrating how, what capacity we have available to be able to write oil and gas business. So just to give you a brief about the consortium and how it falls into the scope of national content. Uh, the consortium comprises 18 members, 18 insurance companies. And all these insurance companies are licensed by the Insurance Regulatory Authority of Uganda and uh, therefore authorized to write business in Uganda. And by being incorporated in Uganda, that alone qualifies for being a local, a local company. So we can confirm that all the players in the oil and gas space in the insurance sector are actually local, going by the definition, I mean by the qualification of uh, being incorporated. So what we're looking at in terms of uh, national content is, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, subdivide this in uh, four areas. One, we're looking at labor. Now, on the side of labor, all the insurance companies who are going to participate in the oil and gas space um, have identified key personnel who are, going to be, uh, who are going to be trained. Some have already been trained, actually, and the training is still ongoing. And this is a person who's be, who will be specifically handling oil and gas activities. All these persons, I could say probably 90% of them are actually uh, Ugandans. So with that, we pride ourselves in uh, demonstrating yet again that uh, national content is being observed here. And uh, also the skilling of these personnel means that they'll also go on skilling others at lower levels and thereby creating uh, a pool of uh, skilled uh, workers in the, in the insurance sector. On the side of our capacity building, here we're looking at stakeholders uh, who are now outside, uh, uh, outside our activities as insurers. We're looking at um, contractors, 
We're looking at the communities where these activities will be taking place. Uh, we're looking at um, all other stakeholders who are involved in um, oil and gas. And what we're doing here is to make sure that um, they understand our business, they understand the terminologies, they understand the claims procedure, to make sure that in case of any, uh, any claim, uh, they are at least mindful of the processes that we go through uh, as a sector. And that way we believe that um, they'll get to, um, I mean, we'll be moving together in a seamless way as we, uh, as we're all participating in the oil and gas space. Um, health facilities, we're aware that um, the nature of work which is going to be uh, conducted or which is even already being conducted uh, can result in injuries. So the intention is to work closely with the health facilities uh, they may need to be equipped with uh, better medical facilities, medical equipment, drugs and the like. So part of our agenda as an industry is to make sure that we work closely with them and make sure that in case of any injuries in the fields or even other areas um, uh, not related to, I mean not close to the oil fields, that they are able to uh, address the injuries as and when they come up. So this is something that we've also uh, uh, earmarked to do. We will also be participating in the area of research, development, and innovation. And here we're mainly looking at IT. And uh, the whole idea is to make sure that um, we simplify the way business will be conducted. We've developed apps. We've uh, come up with IT platforms for conducting business. And the whole idea is to, for anyone who, is not, who cannot access us easily, they can be able to do so through these uh, platforms. This we can really demonstrate with the Moto third party platform and also uh, I think the marine platform as well, which, is, um, which, has, uh, which has been rolled out. On the goods and services side, we can confirm that all of us, as already indicated, that we're all local players. All the purchases are purchased in country. Very little of this is actually uh, picked from uh, out of the country. Here we're looking at um, stationery, we're looking at furniture, we're looking at uh, IT equipment. All these are purchased from local service providers and thereby enabling them to uh, get some revenue and also ultimately government also benefits uh, by way of taxes. I'll very quickly touch on the challenges. Um, I think we're all aware that uh, ESG I think is uh, becoming an issue as we go about this project and we're seeing I think uh, some NGOs and uh, some social sectors, some, some social groups, you know, trying to uh, sabotage the project. But we can confirm as a sector that we're working, we ensure that um, we protect the environment. And this we can demonstrate by working very closely with um, one conservation group called Umoja, with whom we partner. And uh, across the country, we conduct programs which ensure that we're compliant with uh, protecting the environment. Finances are a trick uh, when you're involved in uh, such activities. So all that would like to do definitely will, be, will require financing. So we hope that we'll be able to get uh, sufficient financing to be able to, uh, to uh, pull off all the, uh, you know, all the activities that we've uh, lined up. And then the last one is as a sector, our capacity goes beyond the local capacity. We also tend to tap into external capacity which, which has already been guaranteed. But for as long as we're not allowed to use that capacity, then it means that uh, it stifles you know, the growth of the sector. So probably these are discussions that we'll be having uh, as we go along. I would like to stop there for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ronnie. Um, I, too, have a, a question regarding um, balance sheet, just considering the sheer size of the project. But I'll save my question for the Q&A. Um, moving on to uh, Veronica. Um, Veronica. PwC has been uh, one of the major companies in the advisory space for oil and gas. And I know you have a significant advisory business at PwC. And you've dealt with uh, several clients over a number of years. So maybe talk us through some of the experiences you've had uh, dealing with those clients in the advisory space, specifically uh, in the oil and gas sector. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, PwC has been advising clients within the oil and gas space, and one of the opportunity we see for Ugandan business relates to um, forming joint ventures between Ugandan companies and foreign entities, especially where 
goods and services um, which are required and not available um, by any company which is in Uganda right now. Um, so that opportunity is key for Ugandan business. And um, if you looked at the presentation which was presented by Mr. Ernest, um, you realize that he mentioned that 16 joint ventures have registered right now, which is still quite low. Um, if you look at the benefits of these joint um, ventures, one of them is knowledge transfer, especially where we have Ugandan businesses that don't have the technical capability to, to be able to perform those, good, uh, those services and provide those goods. Um, so what we've seen in the industry is that that is key for development of skills within Uganda and transfer of knowledge within the industry. But one of the key challenges we've seen, especially for the upstream sector, where you have a partnership with a foreign entity, the Ugandan entity has to contribute capital, which is at least 48%. And the challenge is that most of the Ugandan businesses um, are basically SMEs, and they don't have the required capital to be able to participate in the sector. And you'll also see that even getting access to this financing may be a bit difficult because they don't have proper books of accounts for them to be able to meet the criteria to access finance. Um, but maybe in terms of um, helping Ugandans, it, for the financial institution to be a bit flexible with them, um, for them to be able to access financing. Um, in terms of bridging the gap, we've seen that most of the contracting requirements um, require a joint venture to be formed um, if a foreign entity is to provide services, um, which has helped, but it's just to continue encouraging joint venture, Ugandans especially, to be able to participate in the sector. The other key item is around creating va um, value and linkage in other sectors. So what we've seen is around the tax incentives which have been extended um, to Ugandans. And I'll talk about one key one, which is deemed VAT. Um, so if you look at, we have a, a VAT incentive um, whereby VAT which is charged by a tier one contractor to a licensee like Total and Sinoc is deemed to be paid. That's a key incentive, but the only challenge we have is that it's only available to tier one. But we see that most of the local Ugandans are participating under tier two or tier three contractors. So the challenge is that these incentives need to be extended to tier two and tier three so that Ugandan companies are able to benefit, especially as some of this incentive, it helps with managing cash flow mm. from a tax perspective. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, maybe just quickly, that tier one that you mentioned as it's defined uh, in that regulation, is it for companies that have direct contracts with the anchors, the IOCs? Yes, okay. those are the main contractors. Okay. That's noted. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica Mawanda, uh, tax manager, PwC Oil and Gas Department. I think for this part of the session, I will allow Tony uh, to take it from here. Tony, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. It's quite interesting because the two sessions infuse into each other, which is, I think, a very good thing. And it makes the conversation very seamless. Now. I will go on to Mr. Agri Ashaba. Agri Ashaba, two months ago, three months ago, was a small boy. <laughs> now he is a big boy. <laughs> and you can tell from the type of suit he's wearing. <laughs> so Agri, first of all, congratulations. And I think it's a very interesting time for Ugandans, especially looking at the fact that you are going to do something quite humongous, not you know, seen before in this country. Something quite interesting. Now. You doing that brings in the aspects of preparation. How prepared are we as a country? 
managing a camp is not the easiest thing, let alone managing a small hotel. And we've seen this as something that we struggle with. If you went to Hoima, you'll see that not all hotels are performing or doing things to the standard. How prepared are we when it comes to the food story? You are dealing with, or you're potentially going to deal with 4,000 people. How ready are you, or how ready is the country for this story? Um, hello. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, I'm, not yet, I'm not yet a big boy. <laughs> uh, we are just making a small contribution to the whole oil and gas story. Um, well, from where we sit as GCC services, yeah, we believe that what may look as challenges are actually opportunities for Ugandans to participate in the sector. And uh, we, uh, GCC and our clients, that is Total and uh, McDermott, we are all uh, aligned in what actually needs to be done to make sure that as many Ugandans as possible participate in this oil and gas story, especially from the supply of goods and services, um, the employment uh, sector, training and development, succession planning. All these are areas that all of us as a tripartite are keen and aligned to make sure that we develop and the impact uh, for national content is deepened and widened. In regards to food as um, the biggest story, obviously, <clears throat> um, as Ugandans, we are usually used to picking from the, the, the farm or the market, buying whatever you want to buy and throw it in the saucepan, boil your food, and out you go, you eat, and you walk. And we are alive. We are 45, we are 50, we are 60 years old, and there's no problem. You have a stomach ache, you take a bit of medicine or Panadol, and you're still fine. Well, for oil and gas, it's a different story because uh, the type of standards that are needed for one to participate, or even the foodstuffs for those who we are willing to supply, is quite uh, very stringent. However, the good thing is that it is not rocket science. The good thing that is that it is not something that we cannot do. Yes, there will be a painful process, especially for small and medium enterprises, smallholder farmers, and everyone that is needed to be moved from where they are to a standard that will allow them to be able to enter the oil and gas story. But that gap, um, as GCC, we have a couple of uh, people who are in country trying to support the process. Uh, we have also been engaging uh, lengthy uh, conversations with Total and McDermott to make sure that these gaps can be plugged and aligned and made uh, available to the farmers, known, so that they can start to work on them. And probably in a period of about 9, 15, 16 months, uh, a couple of them will be up and able to be able to supply. Obviously, it calls for a lot of resilience. It calls for a lot of uh, enthusiasm and fortitude from the companies, but also to understand that the standards that we are looking for and largely ISO 22000, 2018, and also the HACCP process, which is the hazard um, analysis critical control points. And these are areas of the food process that you need to control to make sure that either food doesn't go bad or becomes poisonous in the process that you're getting it from the farm to the fork. So from the way people grow, uh, the seedlings, the fertilizers, the planting, the harvesting, the storage, the transportation to wherever it's going to be collected, and obviously to where we shall receive it from, how we prepare it, and eventually how it gets served to the client, and even how it gets disposed. Uh, because you don't want to have a waste management uh, a challenge. So these are processes which we believe that while they could be diff uh, uh, alien to many Ugandan companies, they are not rocket science, and if we work closely together, we can be able to overcome them. Obviously, the other challenge is uh, on price and supply stability, and this is a, a challenge that we have as a country. We are not used to long-term contracts, which are locked in from day one, and made sure that for the next four years, you can still be able to supply a service of a product at the same price, at the same quality, and at a consistent level. And knowing that most of our farmers largely depend on seasons to grow their, uh, their products, uh, depending on what they are growing, 
it's uh, something that we need to look into and work closely, and not just as us as GCC or McDermott or Total, but the country at large, to be able to provide um, modern farming methods to allow people to consistently grow these products over the 12 months. Because if they are waiting for seasons, for example, now it's supposed to be a rainy season, but we don't see any rain. There's no matoka in the market, for example. So eventually the commodity prices began to shoot up, and then you have a challenge with price and supply stability. So those are some of the critical uh, challenges. Obviously, the rest is on operational capital and capex, uh, storage facilities, uh, where people need, for example, if someone has produced 100 uh, kilograms of tomatoes, if we are going to offtake maybe 50 kilograms of tomatoes, where do they put the rest of the 50 kilograms? So in the event that he can't be able to sell them over the next two days, what happens next? They are disposed of. So, and that means that the next planting cycle, he's probably short of cash to go into the season again, or he will abandon farming and go to a border border. So these are some of the things that we are looking at, and uh, we are looking at it at a, as a holistic perspective. But we believe we can be able to cure them. Obviously, we can't be able to carry everyone. Along the way, a couple of people will drop off. But we are committed uh, to meeting national content obligations. But it's also the correct thing to do, to make sure that as many Ugandans as possible participate in the sector. Thank you very much, Agri. I could see Mr. Robert Gessi smiling. And we're going to come back to the issue of standards, because Mr. Othieno is going to tell us what they're doing to work on these standards or get us to the point where we are not providing poisonous food in these camps. But let's first go to Mr. Robert Gensi. You have done a project before, Self-Help Africa, you have supported, and we have seen your footprints everywhere as the Standard Business Incubator because we are now supporting in the same area. Tell us what the story has been so far. Thank you very much. Um, I will give just a very brief presentation of the uh, of the agriculture development project program that we designed sometime in 20, um, 2018 to respond to the challenges of, well, the challenges and opportunities of the oil and gas uh, activities in the region. Um, So in 2018, we were given an opportunity by the joint venture partners at Self Help Africa to lead a consortium of NGOs that were, you know, challenged to design an agriculture, a holistic agricultural development program to respond mainly to the opportunities, but also the challenges associated with the oil and gas sector. And the main issues around the design, we are looking at the influx of people to the, um, to the area, but also the opportunities that are accruing out of that intervention. And the design took four critical strategic objectives. One around farmer, um, led organizational strengthening, the other one around um, forming farmers around enterprises, but also looking at how we can increase access to financial and non-financial services, business development services, especially by smallholder farmers. You can see my, my brother saying, you know, some will drop along the way, but for us, the main focus is we want to give the smallholder farmers, resource constrained, limited resources, be, have an opportunity to engage in these opportunities. And then the last, the other uh, strategic objective was really to bring them, um, bring up a voice in which they can influence policy around their opportunities. So the design five year target um, takes place and targets 40,300 farmers, initially in the four districts, but whose benefits would trickle down and reverberate to the 10 
other districts um, in the region. And um, we also aimed to reach 42 micro enterprises, 49 SMEs, and 338 of farm um, businesses. When we designed that, we were given an opportunity uh, to harvest some quick wins. And we are very uh, privileged to have intervened in the, um, in, in the area. And so we've gotten some stakeholder analysis. We've done some value chain studies. We have a lot of information about the cassava value chain, how it operates. We've done rice, maize, uh, horticulture, livestock. And, fa and fish, and we have data that relates to the profitability of some of these, uh, of all these value chains. So any interested investor, any interested person from, from the business, from any area, private sector, can come and be able to access this information. We also chose 500 smallholder farmers, including uh, horticulture farmers, and worked with the Changwari uh, Dairy uh, Farmers Cooperative, worked with the district local government of Hoima and um, refurbished the pig abattoir and expanded the, the business um, opportunities for 100, selected 100 pig farmers. One of the things that I would like to mention is that we also did um, value chain analysis functionalities. We looked at the input supplies, we looked at the um, extension services, we looked at the farmer groups, we looked at the financial services provision in the area, we looked at the product quality, but also market access. And we were able to do um, a kind of uh, a, an analysis of how these functions are operating. So if you want any investment uh, or uh, opportunities, these are, this is information that is available that we can give you. I just wanted to mention that in the design, we looked at opportunities for investment, we looked at knowledge building, and we looked at um, strengthening uh, smallholder farmer or led organizations in a bid to compete favorably and be able to supply the emerging food needs in the uh, uh, in in the in the in the Albertine region. The challenges that we can highlight, and some of these have been highlighted by some of the uh, previous speakers since morning, but which can be turned into opportunities for investment, are uh, on-farm challenges, things related to post-harvest losses, things related to technology, things like uh, storage things related to um, value addition. Um, the, the, farmer, the, the smallholder farmers with their small land hold, holdings need to be given the capacity to build their businesses, as, uh, their agricultural enterprises as businesses, so that they are led into developing um, farmer associations that can operate as businesses. Of course, there is lack of financing opportunities. And this is a call to, you know, Stambic Bank. I, I am happy to learn about the, uh, the, the, the incubation opportunities that they are bringing out. These are opportunities that these farmers through their associations can be able to benefit um, and, and, and participate actively in these opportunities. Technical advisory services especially on business development, is a very, very, very strong um, constraint. Of course, uh, product um, supply chains, they, they are inefficient because of the nature of the market and demand supply, and, demand and supply forces. And of course, the, the real, the technical know-how of how do we do marketing, the four Ps of, of, of marketing, and of course, the, the technology. We, we need investors uh, in, in, in the, the, the different value chains. The, it's going to be an 
a great opportunity for purchasing power because of the influx of markets that are going to, you know, to, to, to come up, paid workers in the oil and gas. The industrial baseline study in 2013 revealed 30,000 direct jobs and over 150,000 indirect jobs. Robert, we are running out of time. We can, if you could wrap up, please. This is the last, yes. Okay. Um, if you look at the strategic location, if you look at the high infrastructure developments that have happened, the latent demands of agricultural products, the population is estimated to double in the next 25 years. All these are opportunities that we would be able to uh, harness and have our smallholder farmers actively participate in the opportunities occasioned by the oil and gas sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much for that precise presentation. Andrew, standards. Everyone has spoken about what can be. We've seen the challenges. But one critical thing is standards. Now, most Ugandans, you must appreciate as well, this is a new sector that they're interacting with. When you talk to most Ugandans and you ask them to get ready for oil and gas standards, they say, what is different? And we'll appreciate that they've been in business for quite some time, and this seems to be seemingly different. Talk to us about standards. Uh, thank you, Tony. I, I seem to be the only regulator here, so I'm probably in for a number of questions at the end. But um, we seem to have our ducks all lined up, save for the embracement and understanding of standards. Uh, from where we are seated, it would appear probably only the licensees and uh, maybe the tier ones really understand uh, the importance of standards and have embraced the standards. When you go lower, then you have more and more uh, of those who do not actually understand what it's all about. And so uh, interactions like this are very important. Of course, we all know now that in the oil and gas sector, it is characterized by high quality health, safety, environmental standard uh, requirements. Now, UNBS, we have been mindful of what is going on in this area, and we have been working very closely with the regulator, that is PAO, but also UNOC, uh, in order to look ahead and see uh, what kind of standards would be needed to support uh, this very, very big sector. As I speak today, as a country, we have um, just about 4,300 Uganda standards. About 1,000 of these are indigenous standards. Those are standards that are developed largely uh, from scratch uh, for Uganda. The bulk of them, more than 3,000, are internationally adopted standards. We have the option of either developing an indigenous standard or not reinventing the wheel, and therefore you go for the adoption of a standard that is already at the international level. Now, I just wanted to make something very clear that uh, appeared uh, to, to have an understanding somewhere. The, the notion that localizing standards means compromising on the quality should, should never be. You can have a local standard, its quality is not compromised. You can have an international standard and it would be equivalent to a local, or as Ernest advised us not to use the word local, in this instance we can use a national, a national standard. Now, to date, we have about 450 standards specific for the oil and gas sector, uh, covering areas such as uh, petroleum and petroleum products. This is mostly what we are going to get out of the crude oil, so we, we need to know what we have to make out of it, and there's a standard that provides the specification and the guidance on these. We have standards on drilling and drilling-related equipment. You need to bring equipment that is able to reach the depths that you require, uh, but also in an environmentally friendly manner as such. We have standards on petroleum management, 
largely on occupational health and safety. Uh, we have standards on petroleum distribution, on uh, petroleum transport and refining, but also on goods and services, uh, where the likes of the GCCs fall, providing so much food and the rest. So that is, in summary, the, the story about standards. Standards is an ongoing process, development of standards. Um, unlike what most people may think, UNBS actually does not sit down uh, to write the standards. We just facilitate the process. It's really stakeholders in the various uh, areas of in interest that actually are the ones who sit down and write the standards. As UNBS, we just facilitate to ensure that uh, the due process is followed uh, in respect of standards development. Um, maybe as I, as I wind out, in, in, in the discussions that we've been holding uh, with uh, PAO and UNOC, I think what we have zeroed in on is the requirement uh, for, for all the various project agreements to reference the use first of Uganda standards. Where they are not available, then we can reference the international standards because we are a sovereign country and we have the national standards uh, that must be adhered to. Um, of course, standards do many things. They ensure we are safe, uh, health and safety wise, but they do also support trade facilitation, those who are in production, those who are looking to supply goods. Uh, you realize that um, probably whoever is asking for those goods will require to, for you to demonstrate that those goods are actually safe. And you only do this through standards, through a process called certification. You get your products certified or you get your services certified. And with that certification, that is demonstration to whoever wants those services that what you're providing is safe. Um, challenges. I need to wind up with challenges. Standards, as I said, are developed by stakeholders. Getting these stakeholders interested to sit down to develop these standards is very difficult. They are always busy doing other things. That is one. Two is the turnaround time in developing these standards. On average, it takes about eight months to develop a standard. Sometimes that is too long a time uh, for us to wait for a standard. But we have administrative interventions uh, to bridge that gap. Three, of course, is the knowledge and understanding about the standards. If you engaged MSMEs and uh, did some kind of study, you'd probably be hard pressed to get 65% who really understand standards. And uh, so when, um, when my sister was talking about the, the, the project from the, Af uh, from the African Development Bank uh, to support MSMEs, uh, I was excited because I'm sure one of the gaps that will be identified there would be standards and certification, understanding that whole area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think that uh, that preempts the questions, and I'm glad you stopped at the challenges. <laughs> that preempts the question. So we're just going to go into a quick Q&A, and uh, I'll allow my brother Michael to lead us on the quick Q&A, and then we can move into the next session. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, we can open it up to questions now. I would just ask that if you do ask a question, please state your name and the organization where you're from. And uh, you can address your questions to any of these panelists. We'll try and uh, respond to as many as we can in the time we have. Tony, I'm not sure how much time that is, but not much. Um, we have, we'll do 12, 12 minutes, 12, 13 minutes for them. All right. So. Marcus, you can help us actually point out the, um, maybe hands up and then the microphone will be brought to you. We can do it that way. Hello, thank you. My name is Joe Mangini. I work with Joe Up Solutions and we supply PPE. My question is going to go to the last, the last three panelists. That is Albert, I think, Robert, and uh, sorry, the UNBS gentleman. Uh, 
I, I, I have a challenge about, uh, about the, the, the capacity improvement for people in Hoima. Uh, let me just make a story about it just in a minute. Uh, before, the Hoima people were digging and carrying out their farming properly. Now, when the oil and gas came, it came with money, so, so uh, bought these people's land, and the people ran away during the, uh, the, the raps and everything. So when they bought the land, they sold the land, these guys got money, they bought border borders, and they ran away. They started raiding border borders. I know very many people there who bought border borders. When you, a police catches him, drops that border border and goes and picks another one. Here is the, here is the question. So, after they have sold the land, the people that came to buy the land are the ones that are doing the farming now. So the people that sold the land are back on border borders. What are you doing to help those people off the border borders and to improve their own capacities again? Uh, question number two is going to go to the localization of local content. I feel like local content has been so much localized can you, to Bunyoro region. Can you be more f specific and focused with your question? We have no time. Please. Okay. Uh, the second question is going to go, is about uh, localization of local content. Yeah. I feel like local content has been so much localized into Bunyoro region. You find that areas outside Bunyoro, like Eastern region, personally I come from Busia, there is no one in Busia who knows anything about standards in local content, who knows anything about farming for oil and gas. What is being done about that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, starting with that last question seems like a question about sensitization, which may be uh, Betty, you can take. Um, and then for your first question, um, I understood it as a, a challenge that many pubs have uh, in trying to get back to economic activity. So anyone can take that. Agree, uh, Andrew, anyone who has any comment on, on uh, pubs and how we can get them back. It's off. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, that's a tricky one, because yeah. I don't think anyone of us here is involved in uh, research climate action plans. Mm -hmm. However, um, with all the good things that happen with any industry, there are obviously a couple of smaller uh, challenges like those that will eventually out, outpour uh, the many opportunities. But I think um, because their biggest asset has probably been sold off because of the start-stop nature of the oil and gas industry, they need probably now to be engaged to reinvest whatever it is that they received into acquisition of uh, another asset in terms of land and they get back into the project. And it's not only them, many other people have left the oil and gas businesses because of the long delay that happened between probably 2011 and now. Um, and it's not only peculiar to the people of Bunyoro. I also know people in Kampala who have closed offices and turned into other businesses. It's basically part of the game and um, probably we'll have another session on resilience and see what needs to be done to approach, uh, to provide solutions to that. Okay, Robert first, then Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, as safe perfect, we have some, you know, some experiences um, doing resilience programming, and that's a case of how um, these border borders, even in their border border, type of you know, vocation, they can engage actively. For example, uh, we've done uh, value chain functionality analysis, and even with that border border, can they be led into organizations um, managed by themselves, such that they are able to create a critical mass where they can probably engage in input supply where they can engage in value addition or processing. For example, we have experiences where, you know, uh, like say, a, 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 you know, cassava processing, a border border puts a, 
you know, a processing machine on his, on his border border and runs around the village, you know, processing a bag of cassava into high quality cassava flour for 1,000 shillings. That is organizing them to be able to engage in meaningful activities on any of the identified value chains. The key point is let them get organized, help them to get organized in farmer-led or just, just themselves leading their own organizations into strong, powerful, and very strong. They can go to you know equity bank, they get a, a small loan, we can organize them into um, um, savings with a productive purpose, and they can own some of these, you know, and be able to provide some of these services. The idea is to create opportunities where everybody can be able to participate actively. And by active, we mean being able to meaningfully earn a decent living in any of the ventures that they will be involved in. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I, I tend to align with most of what has been said, but maybe I'll just tweak it a little, uh, because in other jurisdictions that are a little well-to-do financially, which hopefully we are getting there, uh, we can probably look at putting aside some of the money from the oil fund, uh, not for loans, like he says, because they'll never pay the loan, but for, for grants that are specifically targeted towards reskilling and adult learning uh, for these guys. Of course, they have to be organized, they have to be identified, but the idea is that you reskill them, you give them opportunities for adult learning. Uh, it has worked in other countries where uh, industries have shut down, but people uh, look elsewhere for other living. Thank you so much. Um, I think. Um, Tony, a lot of uh, that question also has to do with financial literacy, interventions that you're directly Definitely. making uh, with the incubator. Definitely. I mean, that is an ongoing process. And it's also very interesting uh, to train someone who has never held money on how to save money. So the first thing, of course, is to show them how to make money and then help them on doing that. But I think financial literacy is an ongoing process. I mean, even the big boys still undergo through a lot of difficulties. But it's something that we constantly do, and it's something that we are willing to take further. And I think in the conversations around agriculture, that has also become one very critical area. And we intend to do it, especially with this program that uh, we are pushing or, or supporting Petroleum Authority with along the pipeline districts. But for now, allow me to ask Betty to answer that question in regard to nationalizing this story. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jarab Solutions. Uh, the question is on localization of local content. Local content has been localized. The people from other regions are not participating, especially Eastern region. Well, uh, what I can say is that Mr. Rwondo this morning presented, gave us a slide on the value that has been retained in the country. And uh, he gave us, uh, for the period 2017 to 2020, 171 million US dollars retained in this economy as a result of the services. But I can tell you that only less than 10% has gone to the companies that are within the Albertine Graben meaning the focus is everywhere. I, I don't have statistics for the Eastern region, but the focus is on everyone. There is some bit of affirmative action for the Albertine Graben for very clear reasons, especially in terms of uh, getting the basic skills, but also uh, the supply of available goods and services. But the focus, the approach is for everyone everywhere. So when you get the information irrespective of where you come from, get yourself prepared, get on the national supplier database. There is no limitation to which region you come from. Uh, then the other one that I, th I thought I need to talk about is on the person who left the border border and then went here and went there. I think the discussion we talked about on linkages of the oil and gas sector to other sectors of the economy is trying to address that uh, problem. We do not expect the farmers in the Albertine Graben to run away from farming to providing for oil and gas. Our expectation is that we need to work together with the agriculture sector to get them vibrant enough 
to produce enough for the over one million people that will come to the Albertine Graven. So the same analogy goes for the, the rest of the sectors. We do not expect the transporters to run away and come to these other sectors of the economy. So that is something that we are looking at seriously in terms of linkages and please encourage whoever wants to live where they are to join the oil and gas. Oil and gas is also going to support uh, other sectors become more vibrant like tourism sector through the many uh, experts that will be coming here, the many visitors that have a good appreciation of uh, tourism amenities. So we need to look at the economy comprehensively and let us talk to all these people to ensure that they remain where they are. Oil and gas will need the transporters, will need the farmers, will need the environment specialists so we don't have to all run to the oil and gas sector. At least will crowd out the economy and have negative impacts like we've had in other countries. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Betty. And one last question just before we leave the stage. This is a question that has come from a gentleman who has been promoting the conversations of this oil and gas story, especially the pipeline story between the two countries, Uganda and Tanzania. And this is Ambassador Kabonero. His question is, is there any harmonization with the standards in Uganda with those of Tanzania to make sure that our contractors can easily operate in the two countries with easy mobility because it's a transboundary story and standards, if anything, have to also be seen in such a way. I think this goes to you, Andrew. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, brief and straight answer. Yes, there's a lot of harmonization work on standards going on in the ESC, not only Uganda and Tanzania. We are working as a block, and of course we're happy to, to have the DRC on board now. So, so far, we probably have uh, upwards of 1,500 East African standards harmonized across the board. I can't give you the figure yet for those specific to petroleum, uh, and that sector, but probably upwards of 250. So yes, it's ongoing work, and uh, we already, it's, it's a process we have a good handle on. Okay. Fantastic, over to you, Michael, as we can close, or as we close. Yeah, uh, I think only thing that's left, Tony, is to thank these panelists. Thank you so much for giving us a, a very wide perspective uh, on challenges, experiences, and opportunities happening in, in the sector today. I think uh, a lot of lessons have been shared, uh, but I thank you so much, and thank the audience for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen, for those very insightful words. We are getting to the tail end of today's uh, sessions, and we have one last panel and two presentations before we call it a wrap, so we should be out of here as planned. Before we do that, I have two quick uh, announcements. I do know that we are in the Holy Week, the Easter weekend is upon us. And if you are feeling generous, and by generous I don't mean financially, but with your blood, one of the longest serving companies in this country, Multilines International, as part of its CSI, celebrating 20 years of business in the country, is doing a blood drive right at the bottom here at the entrance. Uh, if uh, this is your way of giving back this Easter season, whether it's because it's Easter or because it's what you do, you give blood, please feel free to join them in the blood drive at the bottom. Now I would like to call a gentleman who is an accountant, a bank executive, and has been for a very long time. In 2002, he was appointed uh, the executive director of Finca Uganda, 
which is a microfinance deposit taking institution, uh, position he held till 2010. He was then appointed to the managing director and chief executive of Centenary Bank where he served until Jan of 2015 and I think he still serves today. He is a Rotary member of Chiwatule and he is also a Paul Harris, Paul Harris Fellow. I need to ask him what that means. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Chief Executive and uh, Managing Director of Centenary Bank, Mr. Fabian Kasi, to give his remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and uh, I bring you greetings from uh, Centenary Bank. My presentation today is uh, okay. Okay, how do we have it on? Well. Can somebody support? Huh? Ah, okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. As I said, I bring you greetings from Centenary Bank. Uh, thank you again uh, for this conference. Us at uh, Centenary Bank, we are grateful to be part of this. Uh, the presentation today is uh, about uh, what we are doing as a bank with regarding to promoting local content. And I'll tell you that uh, <clears throat> Centenary Bank in this country is uh, one <clears throat> of the biggest local content banking services institution, if not the biggest. And I'll quickly take you through the story of uh, how this has been attained. Uh, what we have is uh, an outline of the presentation. I'll quickly go through, and uh, possibly at, uh, at the end there will be questions. But I'll just you know, give a highlight of what the bank does over time uh, for the last 30 years, and basically, and specifically the interventions for local content because it is uh, the purpose of uh, this presentation. That is basically uh, the history, uh, saying that uh, we started uh, in 1983, so uh, you know, operating in 1985, basically a development bank, rural, it is still Centenary Road Development Bank, because some people sometimes have asked whether we've changed when the year it is Centenary Bank. It is a Centenary Road Development Bank, a bank that uh, was founded to develop uh, enterprises, especially those in the rural areas. The next slide just goes to show you know, the composition of the ownership. As you can see, this is a bank that was founded by the Catholic Church in Uganda, uh, being owned by the 19 Catholic dioceses in this country, including the, the Catholic Secretariat, owning about 70%. So it is truly a local content institution. Uh, but of course, we had to also have partners from out of the country, from France and Netherlands, uh, who came and partnered with the local owners to be able to drive the agenda of the bank. And the agenda, as far as the vision is concerned, providing financial services, focusing on microfinance, but the mission being to provide financial services which are appropriate, especially microfinance, to all people, and particularly those in the rural areas, in a sustainable manner, <clears throat> and of course, in accordance uh, with the law. That summarizes the result Date or the mission, the being the, 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 the being there of the institution. These are basically values 
that form the pillars on which our operations run. A couple of them, as you can see, professionalism, leadership, and so on. But I quickly run to the next slide. I think I've skipped one. Should be able to go back. No? Uh, currently serving close to 2.5 million customers in this country. And of course, as you know, Uganda is one of the countries where not many people are dealing with banks. We have 25 commercial banks dealing or serving about 80 million customers, of whom 2.5 are being served by this bank. Through its branch network, the biggest at currently standing at 81, and uh, close to 190 ATMs, automated teller machines. Uh, agent banking is one of the key delivery channels that has been uh, introduced lately. Currently, the bank operating over 5,000 locations. The bank has also used digital platforms to be able to deliver services to the people, to Ugandans, using uh, phones, mobile banking uh, platform, cards, uh, visa cards, and uh, master cards. I'm sure those of you who've operated, you've seen them currently doing 1.2 million cards in this country, as opposed to the 2.5 million account cards that are being operated in this country. So we can see uh, the, 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 the effort and uh, the thrust that this bank is doing as far as uh, those various channels of distribution uh, uh, are concerned. When we are talking about the balance sheet value currently running at uh, uh, close to 5 trillion Uganda shillings, second biggest, having moved uh, in, in that trajectory. <clears throat> when we talk about, uh, next slide is to do with uh, liabilities, deposits that have been mobilized from uh, the 2.5 million accounts that I talked about, close to 3.5 trillion, uh, which is a market share of about 13% as far as the industry is concerned. Loans that have been extended over 2 trillion uh, Uganda shillings, again, a share of uh, about 13% as far as uh, you know, the whole industry is concerned. Uh, profitability, the bank has been uh, pro uh, uh, posting profits, as you can see in that graph. By the end of June last year, 122 billion. By the end of this year, uh, over 200 billion, again projecting the level of sustainability that a financial institution need to have if it is continue serving a customers in the country. Of course, all this is meant to show where we've been, uh, the kind of preparation, uh, the kind of service that the institution does, and uh, when it comes to oil and gas, the, 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 the level of effort the level of uh, sustainability that uh, the bank will be able to offer. Uh, and this sl slide goes ahead to explain how the bank is contributing to local ca content. And this one revolves uh, along four pillars of financial inclusion. First one is accessibility. As you can see, the bank has given accessibility. If we go to the Albert Albertine region, accessibility in terms of uh, branch network, in terms of agents, uh, we have 316 bank agents in the, in the Albertine region. You recall that we have over 5,000 in the country and still growing. We are, we are in position to also use a mobile banking van to reach where we are not physically, where the, the, the branches are not or where the agents are not. But also, customers can use their phones uh, through the banking platform to be able to access services. The ATMs, we've already talked about the 190 that we have, and also internet or online banking are some of uh, channels that have been availed to deliver services to our customers. So that is accessibility, again, uh, ensuring that uh, SMEs or enterprises that are operating in this region are able to access financial services. The second pillar of financial uh, access or financial inclusion is usability of services. 
we've been able to ensure that we design products that speak to the needs of the customers. We can say that uh, we've so far facilitated opening of accounts that are being compensated along the pipeline through the 10 districts. And so far, we've been able to facilitate all, all, almost 3,500 uh, customers that in that area. And of course, we are going into another phase where we'll be having many more open accounts and being able to access services. But as the open accounts, they don't stop there because they need to understand how to use financial services. Financial literacy is one of the key things that we deliver to these people and continuing to make them understand how to better use the funds that have been given to them as compensation. Uh, okay, of course, sensitizing them, financial literacy, I've already spoken to those ones, as some of the things that we do. And on top of customizing uh, solutions, and we will continue, of course, as we get to understand the needs of these customers, and it is a continuous uh, exercise. The third pillar is affordability of financial inclusion. We try to ensure that these services are delivered at affordable prices when it comes to fees, when it comes to interest rates. And of course, when we talk about, about affordability, it doesn't mean the cheapest. We are talking about, given the kind of services that are being delivered, how, what so -so kind of value uh, is being given by these services, and therefore what can be paid vis-a-vis -vis what the market can offer. And this is a thing that, uh, eternity that uh, we try to focus on. And uh, sustainability of services is very critical. We've looked at where the bank has been. We've seen uh, how it has been uh, you know, strengthening itself as far as uh, profitability balance sheet is concerned. But also, we do all this using partnerships as well. And we'll be looking forward. We've already started identifying those institutions that we can partner with to be able to deliver services because we believe through partnerships uh, we will be able to offer sustainable services. So we also, as we do the provision of services, we want to ensure that uh, the environment is protected. Green financing is one of the key things that we do. Uh, we've financed people to be able to use renewable energy as you can see in those pictures, as some of the things that underpin our mission. And uh, we hope that doing all this will be protecting the environment. But, but also, as we do all this, we've looked at uh, the bottom line, you know, the, the profits that are being made. But as we do that, we aim at ensuring that uh, there is also better social performance of the customers that deal with uh, us, with this institution. I thank you very much, and I believe maybe at a later stage there will be questions which I will be able to answer. I know I'm here with the, some of my colleagues. Benon is seated there, and a few others, uh, and we have a booth. If there are any, any other questions, we can always answer them as they come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kasi. Like he said, their booth is upstairs at the exhibition hall. Please feel free to walk up to the team and ask any questions that you might seem necessary to be answered. Now, we shall enter into our final session for today. And the session is about the focus on mapping a way forward on maximizing national content, especially in the upcoming subcontracting phase. And like Mr. Rubondo said earlier on in the afternoon, and Andrew reiterated it here, we shall try as very much as possible to refrain from using the word local content and change it to national content or community content. Because in Uganda, the word local is really not a nice. When they tell you you are local in Uganda, it's not a praise. Yeah, yeah that one is too local. So. For all our sakes, and this is especially to our international community, local is not, it's not a plus in Uganda, it's a minus, a huge one. So let's use national content while referring to this, uh, or community content. So I'm going to ask my uh, co-MC, Miss uh, 
Pamela Natamba to please come because this will be her session and she will introduce her panelists as the final session for the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, um, as I introduce the next 